Greetings, I'm John Burens, past president of the UUA and author of a recent book about the transcendentalists and social activists. I'm also a past trustee and uh, sometime faculty member at Star King School for the Ministry. And I'm appearing in your inbox today to invite you to a special event, exploring the life of the school's namesake, Thomas Star King. Recently, I finished writing a history of Unitarians in San Francisco and did research about Star King's brief but influential four-year ministry here. When I sent a note to, Star, uh, to Harvard Magazine about my book and my intention to co-edit the works of King, they said he was on their list of neglected people who deserved to be better known. And would I write a vita about him? So they published a brief piece under that series. There I emphasized one neglected aspect of his life. He was the single most important person in saving Yosemite Valley and thus starting the American movement to set aside wilderness and public land for conversation, con conservation. That there is a Mount Star King in Yosemite as well as in the White Mountains of New Hampshire is no accident. The Yosemite thing came about because he was also a key figure following his friend Jesse Benton Fremont and his parishioner Bret Hart in cultivating the first important circle of progressive writers, artists, naturalists, and activists on the Pacific coast. It included the photographer Carlton Watkins who photographed Yosemite. The act setting it aside in the, was in the summer of 1864 when the Civil War was still roaring and it is virtually a memorial to Thomas Starr King whom even Abraham Lincoln had mourned. One African-American historian out here in California has called Starr King probably the only true white anti-racist in Civil War California, unquote. He wasn't a perfect human being, of course, none of us are, but it's interesting that his closest friend from boyhood Randolph Ryer, for whom he partly named his only son, seems to have been a person of mixed race. Recently, I've transcribed a sermon he preached in October of 1862 called The Double Self. It's one of 379 manuscript sermons, lectures, and other texts that are held by the Boston Public Library. And unless I miss my guess, Star King actually borrowed the sermon, as it were, from his own father, who was a shoemaker turned universalist minister who died when his eldest son was only 15. That left Star King as the sole support of his mother and five younger siblings. And I'm just in awe of the work he did and the self-education he did in his late teenage years. By 17, he could write more clearly about transcendentalism than Emerson could, in my judgment, in a letter to Ryer. By 18, without ever going to college, he'd mastered enough Latin and Greek to be principal of a high school. And by 20, he was a minister in his father's old pulpit. At 24, after he had saved one of Boston's leading Unitarian churches, at the invitation of Margaret Fuller's uncle, no less, Harvard gave him an honorary master's degree. Star, uh, Star King was called by Theodore Parker, the best preacher in Boston. And when Emerson or Parker couldn't accept lecture invitations, they often referred people to him. Quaker poet and abolitionist John Greenleaf Whittier kept three portraits across from his writing desk, Emerson, Longfellow, and Thomas Star King. I invite you to join a conversation that I'll have with Star King professors Meg Richardson and Sherry Prudhomme about this namesake of the most progressive theological school in America. The event will take place virtually on Wednesday, September 29th at 7 p.m. Eastern time, 4 p.m. Pacific. You can RSVP to get the Zoom login information just by clicking the button below. I'm looking forward to Sherry and Meg's questions about my research and yours. Hope to see you soon.